Welcome back to another lesson on numerical integration. Today we are going to explore something new and interesting. To start, we must remember this result from a previous lesson on the trapezoid rule. A represents the area beneath a curve and can be calculated by adding up y values according to this expression. Notice the last two terms. One has an h squared and the other has an h to the fourth. These represent error terms. Let's now simplify things a bit. When we're talking about error terms, we're usually more concerned with the order of the error term rather than exact representations of it, hence big O notation. Since we don't know exactly what coefficient belongs to either term here, let's just put an A and a B to represent that generically. As we continue, it turns out we don't need to know the exact value of A or B anyway. The details get pretty complicated, so I omit them. However, a more thorough analysis of the error terms would show a pattern like that seen in the last line. The sum of h to even powers, 2, 4, 6, 8, etc. As before, we don't need to know the exact value of c or d, or any other subsequent coefficient for that matter. The top line here shows what we just saw. The remaining lines show what happens if we cut the mesh size h in half. This is the same thing as doubling the number of panels we use for the trapezoid rule. Now the error terms are expressed in terms of the same unknown coefficients a, b, c, and d. In a similar fashion, we could cut the mesh size in half once more. The final result can be seen in the last line. Here we cut the mesh size in half yet again. We could keep going, but you can see the exponential growth of 2 raised to higher and higher powers is making numbers that are quite large and therefore difficult to keep representing on the screen. Four different mesh sizes should be adequate to illustrate the concept before we generalize it. This screen merely summarizes the results of the past four slides. Nothing new to see here. Take note, however, of the term in square brackets. That is our summation. Even though it gets increasingly accurate with a smaller mesh size, as we've seen in past lessons, it represents the quantity we ultimately want to find. It represents the area beneath a curve, a definite integral. Everything else to the right represents the error, which we want to get rid of. The more lower order error terms we can eliminate, the more accurate our method will become the closer our summation becomes to the true value. For that reason, I'm going to simplify the notation with an s. s for summation, if you will. In what happens throughout the rest of the lesson, we are going to try representing area in terms of s plus a number of error terms. To obtain higher order methods, which are generally preferable, we must eliminate the lower order error terms. That means using clever manipulations to get rid of A, then B, then C, and so on and so forth. For reasons I will explain shortly, I have replaced the A for area with subscripted T's. T for trapezoid since we are using the trapezoid rule. Notation really doesn't matter as long as you're consistent with it. That's just what I chose. The same result could be obtained with a different choice of symbols. The next few slides contain a lot of details, and I don't necessarily expect you to follow along. I have provided this information mainly for the curious students who wish to come back and revisit the derivation. I will say that Romberg's method makes more sense after you've seen how it's implemented. That is explained next, so just hold on. To begin, I pull two expressions from the previous page. Multiply one of them by 4, and then subtract the other. In all honesty, any difficulty from this step is related to fractions. If anything, this is a bookkeeping exercise, which is more tedious than conceptually difficult to understand. I have 3s, but I want s. So I just divide every term by 3. That gives me the final result, as seen here. I can do the same thing for another two expressions, just keeping track of fractions. That's all. 
Pause the video if you care to comb through the details for yourself. Otherwise, I will move onward. Once again, we multiply an expression by 4 and subtract another. That leaves me with 3s, so I divide every term by 3 to get 1s. Notice that the a term for error has gone away in the process. So by manipulating a couple second order methods, I am left with a fourth order method, h to the fourth. Interesting. Now I'm going to use the results from the past three slides and do the same thing. The only difference is that I multiply by 16 instead of 4. Then I divide by 15 instead of 3. I can do it again for another couple of terms. Notice that now the coefficient b has disappeared. Along with that, we have progressed from a fourth order method to a sixth order method. Even more interesting. Now, what happens if I manipulate the sixth order expressions from the last two slides? I am left with an eighth order method, h to the eighth power. So what's going on here? Can this pattern continue indefinitely? Well, we'll get back to that question. Here I have summarized what we just saw. Everything in the first column is second order. Second column is fourth order. Third column, sixth order. And fourth column, eighth order. Perhaps now you're starting to see why I use t's with those subscripts. The first number in the subscript corresponds to the column it is in. The second number is the row. However, because this table is diagonal, it may be difficult to see it that way. At any rate, this notation helps us keep track of what we're doing, especially when the table gets bigger. If you're still a bit confused on the t notation, just keep watching. We'll see more tables that will hopefully illustrate the concept more clearly. Based on what we just saw, we can extend that idea and use this general expression to construct even larger tables. If that doesn't make any sense right now, just wait. I'm going to show you what this means and how to use it. Okay, so once again, this is the table of t's that we just made. For the first column, we must use the trapezoid rule to compute each t. It shouldn't matter too much how many panels we start with. However, in each row, we must double the number of panels from the previous row. That was the first column. Now, here's how we compute the values of t for the second column. This is the same exact expression we saw earlier. I've just added colors to help you visualize what is going on. Same idea for the next row in the second column. And again for another row. Virtually identical process to compute values of t in the third column. Just notice that we are multiplying by 16 instead of 4. Same thing as before for the next row. Lastly, for this small table anyway, we compute the value of t for the fourth column. We must now multiply by 64 and divide by 63. Finally, we can generalize this idea to construct even larger tables, like the one seen here. The same pattern applies as before. Since this table is bigger, hopefully you can see the pattern in the subscripts by now. Just trace your eyes down each column one at a time and see what's happening. In terms of the general expression I showed a while back, to get values in the fifth column, we must multiply by 256. That's because 4 to the fourth power equals 256. Similarly, 4 to the fifth power equals 1024. So we must multiply by that to get values in the sixth column. I've shown some examples here. It should make more sense now. If you wanted to add a 7th or 8th column, you could easily continue this pattern. Notice, however, that you must have at least as many rows as columns. That means if you wanted a 30th order method, you would need 15 columns. 15 is half of 30. You would also need at least 15 rows. 
That means you'd have to run the trapezoid rule on 15 different mesh sizes, each one half the spacing of the one before, before you could construct a table. Now that sounds interesting, but just remember the adage, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. The 15th power of 2 is nearly 33,000. Depending on how many digits your software can handle, this could present some practical problems. 1 divided by 2 to the 15th is a very small number, very close to 0. When dealing with such small numbers, round-off error can creep into our calculations. That's something we haven't talked a lot about yet, but for now, just be aware that there are limitations to everything, and numerical methods are not exempt. In practice, many computers can handle numbers larger than the 15th power of 2. However, eventually any computer will reach a limiting point. Furthermore, round-off error is not the only limitation to endlessly using Romberg integration. This was a rather lengthy lesson developing Romberg integration. I would like to thank you for the time you have invested. Rest assured, the understanding you gain is well worth the price of some study time. It is quite interesting that a second order method like the trapezoid rule can be algebraically manipulated to yield higher order approximations to the definite integral. In the next lesson, we're going to throw some numbers in there and observe the patterns. Stay tuned for that.